uh, Reverend Joy Powell, a political prisoner in New York. Um, so uh, to begin, um, I'm gonna be uh, introducing uh, Dr. Michelle Wright, um, who was an assist associate professor of history at Africana Studies at the Community College of Baltimore County and lives in the city of Baltimore. She has authored a number of journal articles on issues ranging from African and African-American history and political econ economy. She has spoken globally on similar, similar issues, but they focus upon racial and ethnic identity, labor movements, black women's social discourse and social conscious pedagogy. Uh, Michelle is the author of three books, uh, Let's Learn Swahili, The Case of Marshall Eddie Conway, and Broken Utterances, 19th Century Black Women's Social Thought. She has researched and written extensively on the life and work of labor leader Lucy Parsons, focusing extensively on the impact of her ethnic identity on her rhetoric. So without further ado, uh, we would like to introduce uh, Michelle Diane Wright. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you for having me here. This is like, I mean, I'm feeling the vibe already. It's beautiful. Thank you, Sabe, before that. That was just, it It really, really pulled me in. And I, I really appreciate you inviting me um, to be a part of this. This is a beautiful thing. Um, I'm an, I'm an academician. I, you know, I, I'm one of those people that likes to sit around and read books all the time, but I so appreciate the connection between art activism and scholarship. And I think it's something that um, we need to understand how interrelated these things are. And it's something I try to pass on to my students and utilizing different things, whether it be music, visual arts, um, film. I do a lot of things with film in my classes um, to sort of bring across these messages. And more importantly, to encourage students to become activists themselves instead of just being passive um, um, uh, just watchers of what's going on that they too have a voice and they need to get engaged. Um, I started my research on Lucy Parsons probably about 20, maybe a little bit more than 20 years ago in the late 90s. And at that time, there was very, very little about Lucy. I'm really pleased to see that there's so much more out here about her work, about her legacy, and everything that she's done. I've written extensive articles about her contributions. I came to her again um, when I was writing a book on Black women's political discourse in the 19th century. And I had wanted to include her in that, but then I didn't because even though a lot of people, Angela Davis and and and, and a number of other scholars try to include her in um, black discourse, it's not where she would have placed herself. And I really truly believe in self-identification and honoring that um, and moving past the binary because at the time that she was born in, in 1851, there was just sort of a binary understanding of ethnicity or, or what we call race today. Um, that if, we, if you weren't white, then you were black. And that sort of um, um, really is the central part of what I've looked at Lucy. But I, what I provide today is sort of an overview. Some people might not be very familiar with Lucy Parsons. So I'm just doing a, a pretty brief overview of her life, just so there's an understanding of her contributions. So I'm gonna um, share the screen and hopefully that works out. Um, can everybody see that? Is that visible to everyone? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, can you see it? I just want to make sure. I do this yeah, with my students. We can also every, see it. <laughs> I can I do this with my students every day. I'm like, am I talking to myself? Because I never hear anyone um, coming back. So I, I want to go through this briefly so we can maybe have some some actual dialogue about Lucy rather than me just just lecturing. I I I, I don't want to move in that direction. But um I just pulled together um, a couple of days ago, I pulled together uh, just a few of the basic facts about her life, just to have an understanding of how she lived. Really, I mean, it, we think that gender, race, ethnicity, class, all of those things are, are so marginalizing today in 2021. Just imagine being born in Waco, Texas in 1851. 
Um, Johnson County, it wasn't, she wasn't in Waco. She was just outside. It's believed she was born on a, on a, um, a ranch there. And she utilized a lot of aliases, which I kind of love about her is that she wasn't like trying to let her name and her, you know, her government out there for everybody to, to know who she was. It makes it harder to do research on her. So that's the thing is that since she used so many different names and she claimed so many different things in her lifetime to sort of avoid uh, avoid being pigeonholed and trapped into into so many different things that she becomes someone that's difficult to to um, to document. Now she self identified as what we call Latinx and Native American and and. Um, there have been allusions to her having an African-American ancestry as well. We really don't know that. Um, her birth certificate indicates one thing. She told several different stories to several different people through the course of her life with um, how she self-identified. But we know she did not self-identify as purely African-American. Um, and, and, and to me, that's important because what has happened in scholarship is that when she was classified as such, then she comes alongside chronologically people such as Ida B. Wells and Mary Church Terrell and other black women who, who in their own right did quite a bit of organizing, especially Ida B. Wells who was in Chicago when, um, when Lucy was there. And she comes out sort of not fitting within what black women were doing at that time, which makes perfect sense because she didn't see herself as a black woman. Now, looking at her, she was she was called a black woman from um, the day she was born. A lot of there are some records that from Texas, from Johnson County in that area that indicate that she was labeled as a black woman. Um, there are records that in indicate that she was enslaved and I believe she was likely enslaved. However, there's still debate regarding her status, whether she was enslaved or whether she was not. So um, different, and I've, I've written a biography on her as well. Um, and I sort of leave that up in the air, but she was definitely um, not in the binary of, of white or black, although she was categorized as black. Um, but she's interestingly married a Confederate soldier, a former Confederate soldier, a white man, white man by the name of Albert Parsons in Texas in 18, in 1781. Oh my God, it's 1871. Flip the seven and the eight. That's me typing too fast the other day. It would be 1871, my bad. Um, but just imagine marrying a Confederate soldier as a person of color in the 1870s in Texas. I mean, Texas today has its its challenges a, a, with regards to race and ethnicity and, and other types of things that go on down there. Just imagine what it would have been like in the 19th century. So eventually, um, after after they're married, um, they do move to Chicago. They they face so many things. And once they um, arrive in Chicago, Albert, this is Albert on the right, and this is their two children, um, Albert Jr. and Lulu. Um, uh, I, I have copies of their birth certificates of Albert Jr. and Lulu. Um, Albert Jr. is listed as Negro on his birth certificate. Lulu is listed as nigger on her birth certificate. Um, and so, again, I'm kind of inserting sort of these things that have to do with identity, because clearly when she gave birth, whoever filled that those birth certificates um, place that on there looking at her. But um, those are her, the drawings. There are no known photographs of her two children. So they moved to Chicago in 1873. Um, Albert ran a newspaper in Texas. And then when he moved, made his way up to um, Chicago, he too runs, he, he works on several newspapers, eventually becoming the editor of The Alarm, um, a labor newspaper in, in the region. Now, Lucy writes extensively for this newspaper. Um, in fact, many would contend, and I would agree looking at some of the records, that she did more of the editing and the writing than, than Albert did. And, um, and of course, um, you know, she did not get the credit for that. That, that would have been completely out of, out of any type of, of the norm right then. Um, she, um, as her occupation, she was considered to be a seamstress and she took in sewing. This is how she got um, engaged in um, um, trying to organize a seamstress union 
and and organize uh, women in the Chicago area uh, around labor issues. And and we're talking again in in the 1870s, 1880s that she is um, engaged in in these in these activities. Um, again, having to move from place to place to place in Chicago because people did not want this quote unquote interracial couple living in their building. It just seemed like too much trouble. Plus, they were considered to be rabble rousers and you know causing too much trouble um in 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 the vicinity they were out speaking they were writing people were well aware of what they were doing so they moved several times a year for several years with two young children so um it it became that type of a situation um her rhetoric uh, was much more uh radical much more um, incendiary, I guess you could say, than Albert's ever was. She, um, her writing was, uh, I, I, she was uh, been been um, labeled a firebrand, um, a whole lot of things. It's sort of one of the reasons why, you know, th this event is part of it is is more thousand more dangerous than the thousand rioters, which is what the Chicago police called her because she was such a beautiful speaker, and she was a wonderful writer. And um, in, in my research, I, I, I often look for where she may have been educated. I, I couldn't really find anything um, concrete. There's a lot of speculation about her formal education and um, the, the fact that maybe our Albert um, sort of tutored her or helped her when they were still living in Texas. But if you read these quotes, she was a self-proclaimed anarchist. Um, in a time period that was very, very, very dangerous to consider yourself that. The most famous um, uh, piece of writing that came out during this time period, and we're talking around in the 1880s, was something that she penned in the Alarm newspaper called Two Tramps. And basically it was something that encouraged um, what they call tramps, but they it, people who were either um, just just the underserved population in the city of Chicago. She encouraged them to arm themselves and and take down the powers that be to take down that what we call one percent today. And and as you see in the quote, she says, "Let us kill them without mercy. Let this be a war of extermination." She very firmly she was not a reformist. And this is where we get into trouble when we compare her to Ida B. Wells, who was a reformist. She was a revolutionary. She wanted to dismantle everything and start from scratch. She did not see any merit in reforming the situation. And she was an advocate of what was called propaganda by the deed. And propaganda by the deed means using violence in order to, to bring about justice, to take down um to take down those that are in power in order to to share that power and to you know to maintain that power for us as our, as as the people and again keep in mind while she's doing this this is a, a, a let's just call her a woman of color in chicago in the 19th century and she has absolutely no fear you you can see that she just doesn't care she's going to say what she needs to say so so um, she become her rhetoric. I think is her most important legacy that we can still see it being relevant today. Um, what really brought her to the forefront for a lot of people, and I think a lot of historians really paid attention to her um, through Albert, and they realized what she actually did for herself, which is which is typical in such a patriarchal society. We tend to to pay attention to what the men are doing and not really give merit to what, what women are doing and um, women are doing with a much with much greater burden. Um, than, than the men have to do. Um, on May 1st, 1886, there was a meeting at the Haymarket. And the Haymarket was um, a square um, in Chicago. During the day, it was used, used as a market where people sell their goods and vegetables and fruit and all of that. And then in the evening, speakers would come of all different ilk to come and um, and, and and spread their messages. So there was... A, um, a meeting um, at this at this point, and this is the first version 
of the flyer that went out. Now, there was a large German speaking population there. So everything that was printed was printed both in English and German. And you see at the bottom, it says, working men, arm yourselves and appear in full force. Well, someone later on realized, yeah, maybe we should change that. And they took that off. And so there are very few flyers that went out with that on it. The ones that went out did not have that arm yourself, but this is the flyer that was introduced in court. What happened is um, Albert Parsons and six others are then taken to court for incitement um, to riot at the Haymarket. And there was a very lengthy trial. Even Lucy Parsons um, article to tramps is used as evidence in the trial to, to prove an ongoing incitement of violence that not only these, these seven men were responsible for, but everyone who they were related with in any way. Ultimately, um, Albert Parsons, August Spees, Adolf Fisher, and George Engel were, were, were hanged. Louis Ling was someone who they say committed suicide before the hanging, um, but there's evidence that he was actually murdered. And then two other men were, um, they, I guess we would say today, they copped a plea and they did not, they were not hanged. They, they got prison sentences and were eventually released later on, years later. So Lucy becomes um, um, a widow. Um, her daughter, um, her daughter had already passed away. So now she's, it's just her and her son. Her daughter had died earlier. Um, so now, but she continues her, her crusade. She continues speaking and she continues writing. So she almost immediately after Albert is hanged, she goes to London on a very extensive speaking tour. And just as an aside, I, I, I found this funny when I was doing research a while back. She was in London at the same time that the Jack the Ripper murders were going on. And she was accused. They're like, famous anarchist, Lucy Parsons in town. Clearly, she's responsible for killing these people. It's just, you know, the, the way that anarchists were sort of uh, denigrated at that time is, is just amazing. But she's speaking with um, William Morris, Peter Kropotkin. These are world famous anarchists. I mean, world famous, very well known men. And she's speaking side by side with them on a global stage. She also travels extensively throughout the country when she returns back to the United States, leaving um, her son Albert with her friend Lizzie. And she's just sort of moving all over a lot up and down uh, the West Coast, California, going up into um, Portland, um, Seattle, and even up into uh, Canada at the, at, at the time. So she continues doing this. She's arrested repeatedly um, in several different states. She's re arrested repeatedly in Chicago as well because she was she was selling um, some of her writings. She was selling some of Albert's writings, and um, she was just speaking in public about her her beliefs, her labor beliefs, and an anarchist beliefs. Um, and, and I'm trying to go as quickly as I can. Um, in 1905, she was. Um, she participated in the founding of the IWW, and she began editing the Liberator, which was the newspaper that was um, linked to the IWW in Chicago. So again, she has another um, outlet for a lot of her rhetoric. Um, she continues working with such organi organizations as, as Hull, High, Hull House, which is the Jane Addams Settlement House. Um, in Chicago. And it's around this time, we're moving into the 20th century, in the, in the 1920s, after one of her many, many arrests, um, she was deemed more dangerous than a thousand rioters. She, um, at the time, just sort of as an aside, um, she's in a real ill-fated affair with one gentleman that, that goes poorly, but then she ends up marrying another. She has a second husband by the name of George Markham, and, and they live well into their old age. So um, she dies in 1942. She dies in poverty, and she dies in a house fire. She does own the house, her and George um, own the home that they're living in, and they, um, George got out, he lived following the fire. He he made it out, um, but but Lucy but Lucy succumbed to the fire and, and died in 1942. 
Um, so she's ranging from 1851 to 1942, seeing this whole range of so many things going on. Um, just really, and excuse my French, but I, I curse when I'm lecturing in my classes. She gave zero fucks. She was just like, I'm going to do what I need to do and and get it done and i'm going to move forward no matter what i need to do because there's so many injustices in the world i'm going to make it happen um her 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 legacy is just sort of just pushing against every type of oppression imaginable while simultaneously being marginalized in every way imaginable um class race slash ethnicity however you want to define whatever that means um um and and gender so all of these things are coming together and she still doesn't care but her legacy there is a wonderful bookstore if you've ever been to boston the lucy parsons bookstore is 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 great um in chicago itself there they have named a park after her um and there's a street named after her as well um near where she, where her final um where her final residence was and since this is um we're talking about the relationship of art and um, and activism. I kind of want to show a couple of these murals. Um, this one is in Nicaragua. And interesting, the two best known murals, and there's more than two, but the two best known murals of Lucy Parson includes not only Lucy, but also includes um, Albert. So there's usually an inclusion of both of those people in that. Um, same with this one. This one's in Mexico City. Um, I only have the part with Lucy in it. On the other side, Albert is, um, is there with his arm outstretched. And so you see um that she she still has a tremendous legacy she still has a tremendous um amount to to um inform us today as we move forward in in all of the work that we do um to ensure that um let me turn that off um that it moves on hopefully i did not take too long i tried to get through it as quickly as possible but if there are questions or if we want to wait until the end to 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 deal with questions that's fine too i'm going to be here so i'm going to say thank you for allowing me to to be here and share this with you and i really look forward to what everyone else has to say also so thank you thank you so much michelle <clears throat> um i think to uh kick off uh, some questions. Um, I'm gonna, well, first, uh, you know, ask, ask mine and then maybe call on a few people's uh, hands that I saw that were uh, raised, unless I'm not sure if hand raising means like they just really like the presentation or if y'all want to speak. But <laughs> um, <laughs> um, yeah, like I, I really appreciate this presentation a lot because I think it, it comes as a surprise to some people to, um, you know, acknowledge, like acknowledge that she didn't actually identify as Black. Um, and I think that is important. It is, um, you know, from like a historian kind of perspective, it is important to acknowledge that uh, and not like impose any sort of identity on people uh, posthumously. I um, wanted to ask you, what do you, I mean, you know, it's, it's her life and everything, um, but I appreciate, yeah, just the, I guess historian's perspective of anarchism because um, a lot of people who um, come across it, they don't, they don't really see that there's actual history and organization behind it um there's there's very much so this kind of state definition of what it is i guess what what would you think or say um lucy parsons feels about the kind of current um <laughs> political climate that we're living in right now with you know the kind of the ridiculous amount of militarization as well as surveillance um do you think she would do things a little differently in terms of her own safety. Um, you know, these are all like just by your, but just by your studying her. Oh um, no, I think that's a great that's a great question. And I mean, her being an anarchist, there's, there's a lot of different kinds of anarchism, as I'm sure you guys know. 
Um, and there were arguments between her and a lot of other people who self-identified as anarchists at the time where they didn't, where they said to each other, well, that's not anarchism, especially most notably Emma Goldman, her, they had an ongoing public battle beef or whatever you want to call it amongst the two of them. I think she probably would not be surprised. I think she would have said, I told you, you know, this is some, I, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to talk like I talked to my students. She'd be like, this is some kind of bullshit. You know, y'all are watching me. She, she experienced, you know, all of the, 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 you know, coming into her house at, at all hours of the night, all of the, I mean, she was experiencing it then. Um, and I think she would just be like, see, if we had nipped this shit in the bud <laughs> back then, we wouldn't be in the place we are now. It's so much more sophisticated now. I think it would just be, um, she would be just like, I can't believe now, you know, we carry around these little computers in our back pocket and we can be, we can be tracked just by, just by walking down the street. I think that would just be shocking. I mean, the technology of, of surveillance now has, has increased and, 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 and we have to say that a lot of it is by our consent, maybe not our, the people who are in this room right now, but I would, I would say that, um, by public consent of wanting to feel some level of safety and otherizing people like a Lucy, someone who is not afraid to stand up and vocalize and, and point out the wrongs in the world um, by otherizing and marginalizing and making these people feel like that, you know, they're radical crazies um, and that we need the us good people need to be protected from this. I think she would recognize this as, as as sort of the same shit, different day kind of a scenario of, um, yeah, it's more sophisticated, but it's the same shit I went through 100, 150 years ago, um, sadly. And again, I think that's partially by us, again, not the us here, but us passively allowing that to happen not, you know, kind of, we, we co-sign so many things thinking that this is going to somehow improve our society. We co-sign so much shit without realizing the slippery slope that it, it's leading to, what, what it's going to go towards. I mean, it's, it's one of the reasons why I try to encourage my students. I'm like, well, if you don't like it, then say something about it. Oh, nobody wants to hear me. They, they feel so um, disempowered, which is the whole purpose of education is to make you feel like you don't have a voice to make you feel like you can't change the status quo or, or, um, do, do anything that's really going to make a difference. Um, to, so, so that those who are in power remain in power. Um, and I try to tell them that's not, that's not the purpose of you being in my class. I don't want you to just regurgitate what I tell you. you, you need to be a thinker. You need to think about the shit you see on the news every night or that you hear on the streets or that you experience yourself and realize you do, you can, if there's enough, if there's a critical mass, if there's enough of us, then we can push back. And I think that's what, that was Lucy's message throughout her life is that if enough of us push back, you know, we, we can make a difference. And, and sadly, we didn't listen to her in her day when she was crying out and when she was saying these things, sadly, in my opinion, so. Right, truly. Um, I'm not sure um, if we have the time for any more questions. Um, I may, I can take maybe one more. I'm not sure also who, which people uh, were raising their hands or if um, I can just read one of the questions that's in the chat, um, it is uh, from Ethne. Uh, what is your favorite Lucy Parsons quote, Michelle? Um, my favorite quote, and it's actually, um, I have it on my door in my office at work, which I don't go to anymore, but it says, um, the people in power, and I can't remember the exact quote, but I'm, I'm gonna paraphrase. The people in power are never gonna let us vote vote them out of power, never going to let us the rich. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's about the fact that they're not going to let us vote. It's sort of about what is the efficacy of electoral politics versus, you know, down on the ground activism. Like really, are, are they going to let us vote? 
accountable. So they're going to let us vote for change? Probably not. There, there has to be a different method. And I think that's sort of the push that she gave. That's my favorite quote. And quite frankly, it's on my door in my office. And I forget, I, I can't remember the exact quote, but you can Google it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Thank Michelle. You. I appreciate you. I appreciate you guys. This is wonderful. I'll be around. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to meet my mind so I can listen to everybody else. Cool, cool, cool. Thank you. Yeah, um, just to, to connect again. Uh, the reason why we brought these uh, figures together is that uh, Lucy Parsons and Bertha Cáceres share uh, the, their angel anniversary, their, the anniversary of their passing, or you know, Bertha's case of assassination, um, and also celebrating the birthday of uh, Reverend Joy Powell. So um, to transition into our next segment, we're going to go ahead and give this space to uh, Alicia uh, Maria Siu Bernal, um, who is a visual artist um, from so-called Central America and uh, uses art to, to share these, these stories and these messages. And we're gonna also have uh, Seba Ili provide some more uh, music and commentary in conversation between the two. So um, just to give a brief introduction, uh, Berta uh, Cáceres was in uh, Alenca um, fem eco feminist. She was an environmentalist. She uh, was assassinated a couple of days before her birthday, um, five years ago, and uh, she was targeted for her work. Um, she stopped uh, with her community organization, Copines, uh, the Civ Civic Council of Indigenous Organizations and, and popular groups in Honduras, uh, stopped the constructive construction of a hydroelectric dam on Rio Huarcarque and with uh, uh, transnational corporations and banking institutions uh, back in this project. Um, but not just that, but her work throughout her lifetime, she was um, uh, in solidarity, active solidarity um, with conflicts without, without the region, through in the region um, with the civil uh, revolutionary war in El Salvador in the 1980s. Um, and in her home communities of, of the Lenca uh, people in La Esperanza in Tipuca, Honduras. Um, after the military coup in 2009, she too was at the forefront uh, of the struggle, providing this, this analysis from indigenous, you know, environmentalist, uh, feminist um, uh, perspective. And uh, her work is very, um, symbolic and emblematic across the, the region, across the continent and across the globe. So um, we wanna give honor to her life and her struggles and we do so uh, through this artwork that we all produce. So um, with Alicia, we can go ahead and uh, pasar la palabra and she'll be sharing some of her, her work dedicated to Berta and all struggles across, uh, across the land. So Alicia, you would like to share your screen. The space is yours. I think Alicia was having some internet issues. Um, Alicia, are you there? Cool. Okay, um, we're gonna go ahead then to go with Seba. Seba's down and ready and available. Um, and we'll go into the music and then try to get reconnect with Alicia. Unless Alicia, are you there? No, I think she got disconnected. So we're gonna see, uh, try to provide an alternative, get her on, on the phone uh, instead. And uh, we'll be reconnecting with Alicia in a minute. Uh, for the time being, let's uh, go ahead and hear uh, Seba Ili. Thank you. Yes, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Wright or Professor Wright. Thank you for your presentation and, and the questions. Uh, I want to offer this song uh, for us to think about everything that's been said so far and uh, how we use our breath to express the things that are true to ourselves, uh, 
the things that are true for the land. Um, and so as I play this flute, you can close your eyes, you can jam to it, um, but let's keep that in mind, how we use our breath and our voice to, to do what's right. Thank you, thank you, thank you for the hearts and the claps. Um, La flauta es una maestra, and I uh, just want to share my partner Amina Deshay poet was on the drum. <laughs> so shy. Um, I want to share that the flute and all these instruments are also teachers, just like the, the people that we're learning about today. The flute itself teaches us to breathe deeply and really uh, cleanse out any tension, any negative energy. Um, and uh, the next song I'm going to, uh, oh, I like the comments. I just hear this as a soundtrack of Lucy. Hey, from her journey from Texas to Chicago, yeah. Oh, I see Alicia's back. Um, I, can, I can do the song or I can go after since I know you have the service right now. I'll, I'll leave that up to you. I yeah, sorry everyone, my, my internet. Well, can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, I guess I could I could show my artwork now. Thank you, Seba, for that beautiful music. Um very profound sounds from our our roots. Um yeah, Seba and I we share a similar geography where our people are from. Um, my name is Alicia, for everyone who doesn't know me. Um, thanks, Aron, for inviting me. Um, I'm from, originally, I'm now a pupil, um, neighboring El Salvador, and I'll do the screen share right now. Happy to be here uh, commemorating Berta Cáceres and all struggles. Um, really excited to be here with you all. Um, let me see, sharing. Can everyone see the artwork? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, 
so I met Aaron and other students in, in this project that we created. We wanted to come together to really uh, be a voice uh, and to deepen the conversation of why a lot of people are migrating forcefully, uh, being displaced for our homelands. Um, and we created this uh, mural. Um, I'll speak on it a little more after I go through the presentation a little bit fast. And um, yeah, Berta Cáceres uh, for us is, for everyone, is, she's just a powerful voice uh, she gave our people, you know, she helped us regain dignity, strength. Um, she really vocalized the struggles, uh, internal colonial legacy struggles and gender struggles. Um, she's like our maximum leader. She will always be our maximum um, maestra, our mother. Um, in 2016, uh, we were all struck by, by her passing, um, by her murder. Um, uh, I was uh, planning on going to Honduras for the first muralism gathering. It, would, it was gonna be the first uh, mural gather, gathering that had ever happened in Honduras. And we, we ended up doing it in memory of Berta Cáceres. And this was about three months after her passing. Um, and um, this one was held in Santa Barbara, Honduras, and we created this mural in memory of Berta, and we call this one um, Niña Guardiana de los she, as she always uh, said um, in our cosmovision and our cosmologies, the children and specifically the girls, girls are known to be the guardians of the rivers. Um, to give you a little bit of um, context, um, this was in 2016 and Honduras had just recently gone through uh, the military coup in 2009, um, which uh, increased a lot of the, the governments uh, giving out concessions. And as we all say that Honduras and Central America is abundant and it's rich and we shouldn't have to migrate because we, um, the land is plentiful, um, but we, we, we have to, we are forced to migrate because it is kidnapped by narco cartels. And it's not necessarily politicians that are kidnap, kidnapping the, the, the country, but are, but are these uh, financial institutions uh, together with narco cartels. So it's uh, well known that um, governmental, you know, uh, governmental, um, politicians and the whole structure is infiltrated by, by um, organized crime in, in Honduras. Um, so this mural uh, is of Berta and her passing on the, the light and we wanted to show how she multiplied into uh, fires within us uh, throughout the whole entire world. Um, I'm gonna show uh, a few of my work. Uh, I started painting from an early age. I migrated from Honduras in 1998 after Hurricane Mitch and I uh, was 15 then. And uh, I, I've been painting since I was a little girl. And this one is on the United Fruit Company, the memories that I have uh, of San Pedro Sula and then the nearby towns in Yoro El Progreso were uh, just invaded by um, the United Fruit Company and the railroads. And uh, my parents were both doctors and they, were, they, were, um, they worked for um, the cooperatives in the banana plantations and they saw cases uh, of infertility. Um, it, was, it was known that they, they would spray nemagon on top of the workers without telling them when they would spray the pesticide. And so this is a picture of the United Fruit Company in El Progreso Yoro. Um, yeah, my father was specifically a gynecologist and he, and he saw a lot of cases of infertility and cancers and tumors. Um, and it was uh, obviously not, not a coincidence. Um, 
uh, I started really criti criticizing or being critical, I guess, of our of the colonial legacy that that has been happening in Central America and throughout the continent, obviously. Uh, when you know that uh, our mon our money is called lempira, and lempira is uh, our our um, Lenca leader who fought the Spaniard colonization. And um, but the state of Honduras has co-opted our leaders and used it in our money as uh, nationalist symbols. So we, as um, indigenous uh, artists, musicians, yeah. we fight um, those okay. colonial nation-state concepts. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. Also, um, I remember as a child, they would have us repeat the national anthem and in the national anthem, you can hear the domination uh, that is, that is uh, the agenda of the state. Um, uh, one of the quotes that I remember was, uh, India Virgen que hermosa dormías, basically uh, saying that the land was an indigenous virgin, that, that she was beautifully slept sleeping when the when the faithful admiral found her and the admiral being Christopher Columbus. And there is, um, you know, paragraphs in the national anthem that uh, glorify Christopher Columbus and the finding of this beautiful indigenous land just for the taking. So I think the whole entire, um, you know, culture of violence that is being reproduced over and over is a legacy of that, um, colonial legacy and the disrespect to Mother Earth. Um, this is a poster on prison fires that have repeatedly occurred in, in Honduras. This one was in 1997, I believe, where they purpose in and they um, murder the inmates. And this one was 361 that uh, were killed in that fire. Um, to, to, to show the zero tolerance uh, agenda of the government to, you know, do away with supposed gang uh, violence. Um, this poster says, no matar, rehabilitar. Um, this is an earlier piece about um, where I'm from, the Namapipil who uh, experienced an ethnocide in the 19, 1930s, 1932. And it was similar to what is happening over and over throughout Latin America and even here, uh, the expansion of the coffee plantations and they abolished and made it illegal to hold our communal uh, land holdings to grow our corn and our three sisters. They made it illegal to have you know, our basic uh, subsistence living, and um, it and there was also a an order by the military government of um, Martinez to execute all indigenous people who were dark skinned. So now we know it was literally an ethnocide, and it was thirty two thousand of Nahuapipiles that were killed and put in clandestine tombs in a period of three months. <clears throat> and. Uh, this is a piece to uh, commemorate that massacre and also to uh, to speak of the mourning that sometimes is not allowed because uh, people can't find their relatives. And the proper way of mourning is um, we're an, unable to mourn our, our dead uh, because of the extreme uh, police and military presence. So um, this is uh, a a painting of the FMLN Special Forces in El Salvador in, in the 1980s, which uh, most of you know that El Salvador uh, went through a 12 year civil war. Again, uh, the fight is for subsistence and land. And uh, obviously we wanna deepen the conversation of why our people are coming and, this, and, and the mass uh, displacements are we see that one of the root causes is foreign interventions in our homelands. Um, this one is just a, a very uh, 
strong statement of the, the ways that indigenous people have been dehumanized. This was, these words come from the Salvadoran newspaper of the 1930s. And we were um, labeled as communists as an excuse to, um, to create and perpetuate genocide. We were labeled as savages, uh, vandalic hordes. These are literally uh, words that come from the newspapers. Virus infested, peasant, uh, vandalic hordes. Um, so, so yeah, I use art to be critical of um, the social um, agenda that, that these so-called governments have on our people and uh, as a way to decolonize our own people. Um, this painting was used in the cover of Karina Alvarado and Alicia Ivone Estrada's book, U.S. American Central Americans. Um, yeah, I was influenced and a lot of us have been influenced by the Zapatista movement. And this is a painting of Oventi. It's called in, in an autonomous community in Chiapas, southern Mexico. And And um, yeah, speaking on the corn and how uh, transgenic seed has polluted native corn and affected uh, farm farmers. Um, this is a mural that I created in Baja California in the Cucapa encampment, which the Zapatistas called out for international solidarity with the Cucapa community uh, that live right across the border. And there's Cucapa up, up here too on the other side of the border. And they were fighting for fishing rights in the Gulf. Um, the big ships were, they weren't able to ship in their traditional um, sh um, shipping areas because the Mexican government was not giving them uh, permits and the whole zone was being militarized. Um, so the Zapatistas called on for solidarity for people with cameras to go and encamp there for three months. And uh, we created this mural with the, with the Pugapa children there. Um, just giving you an overview of the work and the ways art can um, can uh, really help out in, in movements and also nation building efforts. This is in Belize where, um, okay, suddenly there's a pollito in my house. <laughs> in Belize, um, they asked me to create this uh, flag, which they use uh, in all of their material and they won jurisdiction over their lands. So um, I really admire the Belize Toledo people. They have uh, managed to uh, maintain their traditional ways of uh, organizing and subsisting off of, the, off of the land within uh, Belize. And they have won uh, jurisdiction over their lands in the highest court of Belize. Had a communication with them. So this is my most proud moments of having painted their flag. Um, but I'll go back to this painting that we created with uh, Aaron and also with other refugee uh, asylum winners from Honduras. We did this um, using uh, their, their testimonies and we really wanted 
to uh, put emphasis in Honduras, but it but it's in solidarity with all migrants and displaced uh, refugee asylum seekers. Um, Berta is seen as central and from her candle light are victims of the 2009 military coup the um, after in Honduras and we also wanted to uh, honor the life of uh, Roxana Hernandez who was killed uh, migrating and also the life of Soad Bustillo Ham. Soad is right here and she was barely 15 years old in, um, in high school in Honduras and she was um, one of many students that have been disappeared, tortured. She was uh, barely in the gate of her high school. She was demanding for uh, funds to go to education and she was in the media for about one minute um, in, the, in the news. And then after that, uh, they disappeared her. And they, um, who, who disappeared her? People uh, know that there is uh, death squads in, in Honduras by the name of the Atik, who are known to have to disappear students uh, ranging from high school to university students. Um, I myself uh, haven't lived the violence straight up in the past years, but from the testimonies of students, um, it is a paramilitary state, Honduras. Um, environmental students, students that have been forced out, they, some of them uh, that have survived uh, live in Germany, for example, and then there's a few here in, in the US. Um, it's just gruesome, it's uh, horrible. Um, Bustillo Ham was uh, found inside a bag and her she was dismembered. Um, and, uh, and most of these cases go on uh, without uh, a fair trial or even a trial, um, they go on uh, with impunity. And um, the way that this, these students are explaining the regime, the military narco regime, is uh, that um, it, all these structures, even the judicial system is, is, uh, is um, infiltrated by, by these uh, organized crime. Um, we portray the the Bahuaguan region too, which has been uh, controlled by African palm owners, um, uh, which uh, not only is destructive to the soil itself, but uh, in Bahuaguan region, I guess Aron can speak more on that. But uh, Bahuaguan has seen uh, extreme uh, disappearances and murders and environmental activists. And um, the image of the jaguar is a symbol of sovereignty for our people, the Nama Pipil. We have a, we have a, um, a confederacy called the Smiling Jaguar. And I wanted to show um, the metaphor of the bee of the beehive, and this is a very special kind of bee by the name of Melipona, which are ancient uh, Maya and the and the and the the current Maya people in the Yucatan, all the way down to El Salvador, know of this bee. This bee is a stingless bee, and the 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 honey is very precious and very medicinal, and the, there's stories that the Maya used to. Uh, organize their social political uh, organization, uh, kind of mimicking the bee. And there's a story that that when bee, when a beehive is invaded by like a bacteria or a foreign entity, they leave the beehive, but then they have memory, even after uh, a second generation, they have memory of where their original beehive was and they come back when the moment is right and they reconstruct their beehive. So that's um, 
a beautiful story of natural a natural um, hermano, uh, brother and sisters, the bee. And um, this is the mask of Pedro Alvarado. We wanted to uh, connect the colonial legacy and the doctrine of discovery and how it has played out up to this point with the illegal borders and the fact that we live on uh, here in San Diego, I'm in San Diego. Um, the nations here are the Kumeyaay nations and there's 12 bands of Kumeyaay nations and they uh, never ceded their territory to the US government. It's unceded territory, um, meaning that it's a basically illegal border. Um, and behind, and Pedro Alvarado, uh, uh, a, a well-known con uh, uh, colonizer, invader in, in Central America, is the one who ordered the construction of the ships that first came to the coast of California and um, led by Cabrillo. And the Kumeyaay have a long resistance to Cabrillo and the mission system here. So I wanted to point that out. And in the back is um, Juan Orlando Hernandez, um, the current narco dictator of Honduras, uh, shaking hands with US military personnel. I guess it's pretty self explanatory. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, the Afro indigenous uh, presence in, in Honduras and Central America. We wanted to really highlight. Um, Agarifuna, indigenous child, carrying the seed. I don't know if Aron wants to add to this to this piece. He was part of the content creation. Um, thank you. Uh, no, that's it was a collective process with a, a bunch of community folk um, here in LA. Some folk, uh, youth that were recently released from the detention center, having uh, crossed this migrant path. Um, but no, I I would um, I'd like to just open up a question just because uh, for time check, um, we're a little behind schedule, but we have some flexibility. So, and I also um, want to uh, save space for for everyone else. I know uh, Seba Ili has another song and also want to leave it up for, for questions for folks who may have. Um, so, um, yeah, I don't know if Alicia, do you have any other like, uh, last words in regards to this this process of this particular art piece or or your art in general, and then we can uh, transition into the Q and A and Saba with some uh, some music. Um, I think that be it. Um, you know, if anybody has questions right now or after Saba. I think there were some questions in the chat. Um, let me see. It was a uh, Maya? Was it Maya or Nawa Pipil? Eh, lo de la B. Um, I think you said it was Maya, right? Uh, yeah, the B is called the Melipona, and there, there's Mayan Codis, the Madrid Codis, that has a whole section on be the beekeeping. Um, of the of the Melipona, but mm -hmm. it but the actual bee lives all throughout from Yucatan all the way to El Salvador. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think um, there were some people that had questions as well. If you want to put your questions in the chat, or you can unmute yourself and ask uh, directly. Um, I think we can. We can do that right now. So like I, I, have a, I have a question if I can, if anyone else, uh, if no one else has a question at this time. Uh, my name is Erika Chilome. I'm just so honored to be here. Thank you so much for putting this event together. Alicia, I just wanted to ask a question about your journey as someone who has lived in the US um, for some time now. Uh, what what has it been like to go back to Honduras and work so intimately with these indigenous communities? Um, and yeah, like what is your experience as 
um, someone who is now in diaspora and, and or has been in diaspora for a long time, um, you know, emotionally and culturally and spiritually, what has that been like for you? Um, I, last time I was there was for Berta's uh, commemoration 2016. And um, I was, I was uh, honestly afraid to go back. Um, it was only 12 of us, 12 muralists. So I didn't, I didn't uh, want my name to necessarily stand out or anything. So because I have um, family and I'm always uh, concerned about the levels of violence, but um, uh, you know, I try to keep updated through uh, Copin and the radio stations and, and just uh, keep painting about um, and try to uh, uh, find bonds and people, you know, that, that, um, that I could uh, paint about and tell stories about, you know. Um, I don't know if that answered, yeah. Thank you. And I see there's a question. Who, oh, sorry, was someone gonna speak? Yeah, um, can Ellie. you guys hear me? Yes, Ophelia calling from Dallas. Um, I have a question, like you mentioned something about Bertha um, stopping the building of the dam. And I'm interested in that because uh, Telsa was like, He's crazy too with eugenics, but he also invented, you know, power through the dam. And his vision was to give like power to make electricity free for all. So I'm interested in why Berta was so um, cautious about that. Do you know anything about any more on that about the dam? Alicia, do you want to take that or you want me to jump in? Uh, go ahead and jump in. <laughs> All right, for, <laughs> for sure. Um, yeah, I think it was, is more like uh, the model of quote unquote development, right? Mm -hmm. the, the intervention of uh, the World Bank, the IMF, the, these big projects, right? These extractive industries would say it's for the development of the local economy um, or what have you, but rather, you know, looking at the interest behind it, who is really behind it, right? And what are the purposes mm -hmm. of it? You know, it's not that it's free electricity for all, you know, there are stipulations there, you know, and they have the guarantee contract, you know, with the government to, uh, to you know, produce these, these projects and sustain themselves as, transnational corporations for generations, for, for decades, these contracts are. And these are decades into uh, research that they do. You know, they find these natural resources, whether it's uh, uh, rivers or, you know, um, aguas termales, like, um, you know, natural uh, sites or, or um, for biofuels, uh, African palm plantations, you know? So these, there's this kind of um, plantation setting, like mindset, you know, economy, uh, whether it's the yeah. banana plantations or the African palm plantations um, or what have you. And it's just uh, the extractive industries, right? That don't really um, put life, you know, doesn't have a priority for life. Like the life is, is exported for profit. So I think I can't speak for, for Berta and her legacy, you know, but just being as part of the, you know, uh, general resistance uh, after the coup and from before, you know, it's again, it's these models, it's the U.S. imperialism, you know, coming in. It's not just the U.S., you know, it's these transnational mm -hmm. uh, corporations, you know, that know no borders, that have these free trade agreements, free trade zones, right? And now even um, it's evolved into uh, these charter cities, which are just like privatized uh, uh, zones. So um, again, it's the concept of that. These are not um, natural resources to be exploited but public goods to be shared. And as indigenous people, you know, we live off the land and, and you know, as a common good that we share for generations to come. So I think again, it's, it's, not, it's the, the general model 
um, and this exploitative industry. And I think for the question, I don't know if you had the same question in the chat of who is the, who has uh, the head of the cartel involved with the US military, I would say mm -hmm. that Juan Orlando Hernandez, the president, you know, these are the, the <laughs> cartels behind it, you know, so, um, but yeah, thank you for your question. I don't know if you have uh, anything to respond. No, yo, that, I, I'm, I am totally honored by that because um, we had an electricity problem here in, in Dallas lately. So I've been researching about grids and um, Chelsea came up and I found it very convenient that they have a car out that's an electric, electric car. And so I knew that he was trying to work with Downs and then I know that Bertha was trying to seize it. I just, I understand the model and then how it's exploited, but um, it's just a lot, <laughs> a lot to unpack right now over Zoom, but thank you so much. I am totally honored by what are you guys sharing and you all sharing is so good. It's so good. I, I just, it's so juicy right now. It's so delicious that I'm just receiving. So thank you so much. <clears throat> thank you. Thanks so much. I really, really appreciate this presentation um, and this amazing collective uh, art, art and uh, art pieces. Um, thank you so much. Um, for our next uh, presenter, uh, we are hoping to welcome the Reverend Joy uh, Support Committee to speak on, um, you know, uh, Reverend Joy, political prisoner. Uh, Gregory, are you there? Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, you doing? Yeah, I'm actually her son. Um, you know, and I wanted to, you know, just speak on her behalf. Um, I spoke to her earlier today, and uh, actually prior to getting on, and blessings, my family. Prior to getting on this call, and um, <clears throat> as I, you know, was speaking to her, and she was telling me, you know, what she had wanted me to say and different things, um, you know, and uh, you know, what I explained to her is that, you know, she's still alive. And she's not dead, so she should definitely be able to leave a message and speak for herself and speak on her own behalf so that she could display, you know, the most more accurate message um, as to what she believed in and, um, you know, what she got going on in her heart and her mind. And today is actually her birthday as well. So, um, you know, celebrating her birthday and, and um, she's very appreciative um, for all of you and uh, everything you all have, are doing. And, um, and she you know, wants you guys to stay encouraged. I'm gonna play a portion of her message um, and then I'm gonna stop it just to make sure everybody can hear it and then I'll continue on. Hear that? Hello. A little bit. We understand that uh, if it's coming from a prison, the the audio isn't going to be the best. Um, so. Um, okay. Well. Uh, <clears throat> all right. Uh, yeah. Well, basically, you know, uh, she just was giving her gratitude, and uh, I'm, I'm going to go and I'm going to get her a poem and. Uh, reader poem uh, for you guys um, that, uh, that she had actually um, read out. Um, if you can give me one second. Okay, I'm gonna read this one. Uh, I'm gonna read this one now. What I need. I don't need police to kneel with me. I need you to get off your knee. I need to get your knees off my neck. Black and Latina lives is devalued. They refuse to protect or correct. 
it's not a figment of my imagination why they want me to forget. I picture George Floyd that one day with the officer's knee on his neck. It has me disgusted and totally vexed. We're pushed to the brink and forced to protest. It's really happening. It's called civil unrest. I do not need to convince or justify your lies as of why you choose not to socialize. If it does, doesn't apply, then let it fly. I need you to know mm -hmm. that I'll rise, rise, rise. Can you hear the mother, father, and children cries? Innocent people of color on death row waiting to fry. Why? What you need to know if I've paid the ultimate price for my life as an anti-violence activist against police brutality and government corruption. Excuse me. The voices surround all over the world like a volcano eruption. Now, do you hear us? Are you taking black lives serious? Have you lost it and become delirious? I visualize George Floyd handcuffed to the back of that cold ground. He pleads, get your knee off my neck. I can't breathe. Repeated history of 21st century PTSD is hard to erase our memories. I totally relate and understand the pain. We're afraid of the terrorists, tried it and feel drained. Senator Cory Booker's voice rang. We need transparency and change. My people came here in shackles and chains, yet nothing has changed, remains the same. I need to feel safe knowing that finally a database has been implemented to weed out the bad apple police out. Instead of tainted, instead of tainting the investigation and giving the thugs in blue the utmost clout forgetting what the real cause is all about. African-Americans are subject to the harshest laws of mandatory minimums by design. The colors of my skin seems to be the only crime. Racial profiling comes to white supremacist minds. Systematic racism needs not go unchecked. The US has created a huge mess. We're no longer, we're no strangers to pain. My mind can't escape. My mentality ill son was killed by police in the most grotesque way on October 10th, 2018. It was a sad day. We're incarcerated and killed at alarming rates. I pray the anguish my mind will one day escape. If violence is not the answer, then why do we anticipate on um, murking people of color? But it's too late. The people are woke and no longer sleep. Our pillows are soaked. For years we weep. What we, what I need to know is, what happened to the emergency person's response team? Is killing black mentally ill people the American dream? On the prowl to snuff us out, will it work? I highly doubt. Terrell had mental illness from a child. It was seriously and definitely not mild. Emotionally unbalanced but also serene, dash his hopes, destroy dreams. On the contrary, in South Carolina, when Dylan Ryan full throttle an African-American church to commit a horrific hate crime based upon what he was taught, cold-bloodedly cold -blooded, cold killed preachers, teachers, and others he sought, bragged and gave it no second thought. I will put together, I will put together hate crimes was wrought. The young white boy didn't run. He wanted to get caught. Shooting or killing him wasn't an option. When the police saw him at the scene, they halted and talked, put him in the bulletproof pet vest and took him and bought him a meal. While we are unjust criminalized, basically deprived, indifference, young man was pat on the back and given the prize. Unity shamed in fear has moved in weeks where centuries couldn't. Acknowledgement is power. At first they wouldn't. More importantly, what I need is President Trump to cease his incoherent, racist, 
and psychotic tweets. He needs to eat some humble pie and become meek. He no longer needs to be blind, but we'll be able to see. And uh, that's just a portion of her her speech. Um, you know, uh, and uh, she also uh, let me see uh, if I can just get some of the just you know just to get some of her original words and maybe some of the things she would like to tell you guys. Um, and I could just go over it with you all. Hold on one second. Um, Peace and blessings. UCLA, my family, that's right. UCLA, I am humble that you all chose to have this event dedicated to me on my born day. She says, she, she says she's humbled that you guys are have done what you've done to uh, dedicate this on her born day, her birthday. Um, she has a, uh, a lot of her supporters on this call, you know, Sister Ann, Nate, um, a lot of you guys uh, that who've been riding with her, uh, you know, ever since, um, you know, she started, uh, you know, her bid and, uh, or, you know, started shortly after she started her bid. And, uh, you know, I, her son, you know, have been with her, you know, since the beginning of this uh, situation, you know, um, when she first started her activism um, in Rochester, New York, uh, in which, you know, a lot of times I would be like, Ma, you know, won't you just leave it alone? But you know, my mother just has such a deep passion in her heart for uh, to fight for what's right and to also speak for people that can't speak for themselves. So nothing would be able to stop her from going out and speaking up, you know, against what she felt in her heart wasn't right. And that was police injustice, police brutality, um, and, you know, just us being taken advantage of because of our race and our colors. Uh, my brother, David, he was killed. Um, you know, and that fueled her flame, you know, to also, you know, uh, march and protest against uh, violence, uh, black on black violence. And, um, you know, it's sad that, you know, my other brother Terrell, he was gunned down in uh, Rochester, New York, um, as she said, in October in 2018 by the police department, in which we believe was a, some sort of kind of act of maybe retribution or whatever the case, because my mother, she uh, will organize protests against the police department because of the things that they were doing in Rochester. So uh, we believe that it was an act of retribution why they uh, killed my brother. And, uh, they overkilled him and shot him 33 times. You know, he wasn't innocent and, and he committed a crime and deserved to be uh, taken into custody. But as she was saying, when you have a you know, you know, I'm not racist. I love white people. I love everybody of every color. But when you have a young white man to go into a church and kill up a bunch of black people and get out and get given a bulletproof vest and a good talking to, but then you have an activist who fights for what's right and her son, you know, gets shot 33 times. You know, they didn't put out any spikes in the road or uh, anything. And right now at this point in time, this is something that really holds dear to her heart. So uh, any of you that, you know, are on this line, definitely keep her in your, you know, um, keep her in your uh, your prayers or, you know, whatever it is, you know, um, you know, that you guys do, you know, be, because she definitely, uh, that's, you know, one of the things that she struggled with and uh, along with her health, also along with um, not being treated fairly inside of the prison, you know, she's had several spats with, uh, po uh, you know, uh, officers and, you know, they took her legal property um, you know, I'm not going to go on and on about it, but, you know, we've worked our way through the situation. Now, you know, I've been able to get her an attorney and, um, you know, I'm going to retain them tomorrow. Uh, we'll just send them the money to the account. And then, uh, you know, we've already been working on her case. So, you know, we looking forward to her, you know, to be released from prison. Uh, I'm looking forward to it to be within a year because uh, the case that they have against her is bogus. They didn't have any evidence against her. They just had her down. And at the time, she didn't have any uh, help. She didn't have, um, she went and represented herself in the court and they railroaded her. So now she has you guys and she also have me. And, uh, you know, I'm going to make sure this time that she gets represented properly. And um, in that, we've already discovered several uh cases and even cases similar to hers that have already been overturned 
So we right now just getting the paperwork and everything together. But I just like to thank all of you. If, if anybody have any questions or anything for me, uh, you want to ask me anything about my mother, you know, um, you know, I can give you, you know, whatever information you would like. But like I said again, um, I'm normally in the background, but she has a lot of supporters that's on this call that. Nate and a lot of people, I don't know all of you guys' names because, you know, but I'm just, you know, the people that I've have spoken to, you know, and whatever, you know, I've missed Ann Lamb over the years. So uh, Margie, excuse me, I've, over, I've spoken to Margie over the years. So she, a lot of you have been very instrumental in just keeping her spirits up and, you know, and she really appreciates it. And um, I just, you know, Anytime I could uh, come and speak on her behalf and, and maybe tell you guys a little bit more uh, personally about her life and uh, experience and struggles, and not, you know, I'd be welcome, uh, you know, to do that. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, yeah, um, love and solidarity to Reverend, Reverend Joy. Um, <clears throat> does anyone have any questions? Uh, currently, right now, um, before we head into um, uh, Seema's uh, portion. I know I wanted to ask, uh, besides writing letters, what's another way that we can support Reverend Joy? Someone's asking if there's um, a website. Oh. Well, what, well, she actually has a JPEG. JPay is actually the, I believe, the best way to be able to communicate with her. Um, is this an app? You can download the app, go to the Google Play Store and uh, download it on your phones. And um, and then um, if you uh, you can contact me and I can uh, I can have her to put you on her JPay uh, or either send you an email. Yeah. So um, if you like to contact me, anybody, uh, you can contact me at um, at my. Uh, on my cell phone, I just give you my cell phone number is 678-754-1436. And you can just send me a text message, if, you know, any message you want to get across, because I talk to her every day. You know, she called me almost every day. So, uh, you know, you want to get get on her list or you want to visit her, you know, any kind of way time, you want brother. to support. Say that number one more time. Or it's 678-754-1436. Three six. Okay, thank you. No problem. Appreciate y'all for um, all yeah, the information I, you're putting in the chat too. And I just want to say this real quick um, before I go. Um, my own personal take, as far as what's going on out here, um, you know what I what I want to say is that um, you know it's just a very important you know that we, we, we look at everything and at the overall picture and any any kind of access that we have to community leaders and different things, we, we need to encourage them to just do more for us, you know, because it's one thing to talk about people mistreating us, but it's another thing for us to be mistreating one another. And, you know, I find that we mistreat one another more than others mistreat us. So, if we can learn more and become more stronger at feeding our poor, and taking care of our people, then I believe we can set the example, and you know, for people not to take advantage of us and treat us in the way that they, the, you know, the police department treat us. But I, but I, I do respect, you know, like movements like the Black Lives Matter. At the first, I didn't understand it, but then I see, you know, the respect that it gained after the fact, and. You know, sometimes unorthodox approaches, you know, create, you know, unorthodox results. And, you know, so, you know, I, even though I don't, you know, um, I don't um, condone violence, but then, you know, again, I want to say this to everybody uh, on this call, you know, if, you know, you don't have no felonies, anything, you know, if it's not against your religion, make sure you, you own a gun, you know, and you get you some guns and some stuff like that, because you know, it's going to come a time just like, you know, when uh, mass destruction broke out and, and stuff broke out at the White House, that's only a sign. And, you know, well, you never want to be in a position to where, you know, your family is in danger or something and you can't defend your family or 
or defend yourself. So, you know, going forward in the future, you know, never, you know, violence against nobody, but protect your families and protect yourselves and love one another and feed the poor. Like, you know, I'm, and, and I'm living in Atlanta, but I rode by and I seen a bunch of poor people today. And I thought, I'm going to go and I'm going to get a couple hundred dollars together and I'm going to go out there and pay some people to feed them people. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, it ain't even no show and I might not put a camera on it, but it's just something that's in my heart because there's a lot of us that's doing good, but we ride we ride past poor people every day. You know, so apart from, you know, my message is, you know, let's treat each other. Let's love one another. Let's love our brothers and love our sisters. And, and then, you know, we could be better examples at treating at, at, at showing others how they should treat us. Yeah, yeah, have a great night. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Gregory. Again, the um thank you, Ann Lamb um, from NYC Jericho, uh, for putting the website, uh, Joy Powell's website in. It's www.freejoypowell.org. <clears throat> and there's also a fundraiser. It's fundraiser.com slash uh, free Joy Powell if you want to donate. Um, so um, for our last uh, featured presenter, <clears throat> I just want to, um, I have the honor of introducing one of my favorite hip hop artists in the world, <laughs> um, Sima Lee. Sima Lee is a Afro-Indigenous anarchist, womanist, advocate, MC, poet, teacher, and photographer who has 30 years of involvement with radical cultural arts, liberation movements, and community organizing. She founded the Direct Action and Mutual Aid Group, Food, Clothing, and Resistance Collective, and the uh, intentional community maroon house please welcome Sima Lee. peace and blessings everyone can you hear me good good okay um this has been a fantastic panel um from start all the way through learned some things and um reinforced some things um some fantastic rebels were featured on this panel. I mean, Compa Berta, you know, Compa Lucy, Compa Joy. I mean, I feel a kindred um, spirit with all of their their stories. As an Afro-Indigenous woman in the movement, yes, I've been in the movement for 30 years since I was a youth them, as they say. Um, I come originally from Norfolk, Virginia, the Hampton Roads area. Uh, we commonly call it seven cities. There are seven cities that make up the Hampton Roads area. Um, it's more known for being the beginning of the English slave trades entrance into the disruption of indigenous lives in Africa and so-called United States or Turtle Island. So Port Comfort, Hampton, you know, where this the ship came in with 16 Nagars and, and, and all of those things that that's, those are my grounds um, where some of the first indigenous people, again, on, you know, on the East Coast, um, besides Florida, um, <laughs> who I wish had just sent them back to the boats, if you ask me, uh, <laughs> you know, but being gracious and loving and kind and, 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 and teaching people how to navigate the lands there and um, being taken advantage of and betrayed and um, the civil war and so many things are a part of where I'm from. Nat Turner and, and, and Gabriel Prosser and um, uh, Hampton Institute, which was the first, you know, one of the first uh, institutes for black learning created by black people. Um, also the largest naval installation in the world. I guess I'm trying to set a picture of to show, to show you where I'm coming from, from its plantations, its maroons escaping with other indigenous uh, people um, in the swamps of the Great Dismal Swamp, if you, I, uh, we've been talking about Honduras and El Salvador, and we've, we've talked a little bit about Mexico and, and these places, and all of these places, one thing they have in common is, is maroon marinage. 
you know, the Maroons who found a way and, and it's, it's, it's so important to, to find a way in a time like we are right now when some people see no way out and to look at something like the Maroons who lived in impossible situations, you know, um, living in mountains, living in, 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 in desolate places, um, in particular, Great Dismal Swamp in Virginia where I'm from, it's a swamp. So can you imagine possibly you have chains on or possibly you have a contraption over your head, right? Um, possibly there are dogs after you, possibly it's hot or freezing cold and you're in a swamp. Possibly there are alligators and, 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 and snakes and, and, and you know, um, just can you imagine? One of the things about it is that they carved a way out of that maroon to create community to take care of each other, to use the herbs and plants that were around to be able to heal themselves and take care of them. I mean, obviously they had cuts and bruises when they were running and trying to escape. They found a way out of the terrain to make a life that was outside of the oppressive regime. And that's the, that is where I come from. And it's one of the reasons why I created a movement in this time as an homage um, to the Maroons and we call it Maroon Movement. Um, we have a program called Maroon House. Um, the purpose of the Maroon House, excuse me, we have a program called Maroon Cast, but the house is where everyone would come together in Washington DC and also initially in Baltimore when I left Virginia, um, basically to gravitate artists so that people can come together and make murals, so people can come together and write songs, so people can come together and teach self-defense, so we can do mutual aid. Um, I am an anarchist. Uh, yes, yeah, someone speaks about the Cimarron history. It's very important. And um, I am an anarchist, just like Lucy Parson. I'm Afro-Indigenous, just like Lucy Parson. And, um, you know, much of the, things that she would have to have gone through um, during her time. Unfortunately, like the first pres presenter said, we're still dealing with those things. We're still dealing with spaces to even be able to organize. I'm so impressed with Compa Berta, excuse me, sometimes I stutter, I apologize. Um, um, I'm so impressed with that movement that they created. Um, Sometimes I just cry and I look at the Garifuna and, 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 and everything that is taking place and how the United States is so wedded to that and how everything that we do, the oppression that we feel within the United States is connected to everywhere else because we're in, literally in the belly of the beast, we're in the empire. Right now I'm in Baltimore city where we have 300 homicides a year. Um, before that though, I was in Washington DC for 10 years, literally. And so coming from Virginia where slavery was embedded and spread and was the basis of our economic plights, our, our, our abuse was, I'm from where the black laws were created for black people, where we couldn't stand unless we were working. And I look and see how that all connects to right now and right here. Um, we're still dealing with black laws, whether they say it or not. We can't gravitate, we can't, we can't just be, we can't physically be. Um, I come from where the Confederacy is. That's where I was born. You know, um, we've had to walk past plantations. We had to take field trips to see plantations and slave reenactments and, um, but a sense of history and, 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 and rebellion was always there and the lessons of that. And coming into Washington DC and adjusting to that was such an interesting thing when this is supposed to be the seat of power and, and um, looking at so much poverty and looking at so much gentrification and looking at a place that was 75% black at one point that is now about 40% and thinking about how we were displaced from Africa and the original Piscataway people were displaced and then we've been displaced again and just the continuous brutality, the, the continuous warfare, um, looking at how rich some of the areas in Washington DC is compared to a Southeast or a Northeast, looking at the continuous 
you know, I've been a part of lots of protests in Washington, D.C. And, and in Virginia, looking at the response of, this, of the state as it crushes us. In particular, I grew up in pan-African socialist settings. I grew up in black nationalist settings, new African nationalist settings and anarchist, anarchist settings. And looking at the response of the police and the state against our movements every single day. And in particular in Washington, DC, um, all leading up to recent events, that brutality, um, people getting shot down in the streets and their backs by the police, um, stop and frisk was highly talked about in New York City, but not what was going on in Washington, DC, which was even a smaller place to have constant police containment. I was not ready for that when I left Virginia. I was used to the Southern way of, of containing us, but I was not ready for the Washington DC version of that. And I was not ready for police. When I say police containment, police on every block, everywhere you go, let me see your ID. I mean, it's, I look at the correlations between all of the struggles that, that, that all of these I call them comrades that we were talking about today and everything that they were fighting against, whether it was their lands being infringed upon, taken from them, um, the manipulation of corporations extracting and, and creating wealth and not giving back, it, it, all, it all correlates. We're all struggling against imperialism, colonialism, racism, sexism, <laughs> patriarchy and art has been one of the ways that I found that I could, first of all, release because the tension sometimes, you know, um, I'm not ashamed to say that I deal with um, PTSD, anxiety, um, diagnosed bipolar, doesn't take away from my brilliance, but the stigma that people, you know, put upon people with mental illness as if our brains are supposed to take all this pressure, the poverty. I grew up poor, the poverty, the racism. I grew up um, gender dysphoric. I have, I'm gender non-conforming, you know, masculine presenting, uh, all of the things, you know, all, all of the things. Uh, dealing with that, our brains are going to have to react in a certain way, right? Trauma happens to us, our, our bodies react. It's a natural reaction. Um, seeing how we don't take care of that as far as community wise, and we put stigma on ourselves. I found ways of coming together through music, art, poetry, healers, teachers, um, so that we could create our own spaces, hopefully that are safe. And if they're not, we find a way to make, so we, we find a way to uh, uh, be accountable to each other in the way that we would like these governments and these corporations to be accountable for their actions, right? We mirror and we do it ourselves first. So I'm big on mutual aid. Maroon movement was created for that. Food Clothing and Resistance Collective uh, was created for that. And then, then the use of music, hip hop culture, which, which I come from, um, originally in an organization called Zulu Nation. I had to resign from that organization. It is known as being one of the first hip hop organizations and political organizations since the inception of hip hop. Um, I had to leave the organization that is known around the world because of injustice, because of abuse with, within the, the structure of the organization itself. But we separated and founded a new organization and we have members um, you know, all around. We have members in Mexico. We have, I believe we have some members in uh, El Salvador. Um, we have some budding members in Africa, different parts of the West Coast, East Coast. Uh, Zulu Union was meant to do the teaching, the feeding, the clothing, the resistance, the music, the art, the graffiti, the b-boys and b-girls and b-theys and b-thems. It was a space and it is a space for us to be able to do more than just march down the street, you know, do more than just um, complain about uh, what we don't like to hear, what we don't like to see, but to be the people who are actually, well, if we don't like it, I believe that was said, do something about it. Com Comrade Michelle said that, do something about it. So that, that, that's the background. It's, it's hard to summarize a life, a life of work. Um, 16 year old me joining with Jamil Alamine's community, H. Rap Brown, um, who is a political prisoner right now. That's my first entrance into organizing um, and coming up during 
the era of the Greek Fest riots in Virginia and um, the riots in LA and riots in Bed-Stuy and ri riots everywhere um, coming up in that radical rebellious background with public enemy, right? That was our soundtrack. Um, uh, Diggable Planets, Brand Nubian, uh, uh, Boogie Down Production, um, fast forwarding later on and I was listening to people like Dead Prez and the Fugees and it's just music has always been the background to the resistance and not just hip hop but for myself being good with words as they say in the hood you're good with words you can you can say it and it's just the way you say things well I learned that people wouldn't always listen to me when we're just kicking it. Hey, brother, won't you come to this mutual aid event? Or, hey, we're gonna go get some petition signed. We're gonna go down there. Hey, we're gonna go down there. We're going to the police. We march on the police. They might be like, eh. But if you say it in a rhyme, if you say it in a catchy manner, if you say that we're gonna get some uh, notebooks or uh, uh, we're gonna hit up this wall that we found and we're gonna do a mural or, um, you know, let's make up some choreography to this and let's do an interpretation. I found that it's been able to reach so many people. And so we created an entire movement around that, a movement that was so successful that the Metropolitan Police Department found it within their better interest to raid our home. Now this home, Maroon House, that we created in Washington, DC was a space created by Black women in films. And it was a safe space until we were raided with guns. We had red beams on us, if you know anything about that, um, dogs. Um, it was very devastating, um, but something that we expected again, I, I started the movement at 16. So I expected, um, at some point, you know, that the work that I did in Washington DC would be just as watched as the work that I did in Virginia. If you know anything about Imam Jam Jamil Alameen, he's been in prison for over 20 years now. And the community that I was in was heavily watched, heavily infiltrated. Our phones were listened to. They would come to, it was, a, it was an Islamic community, Islamic internationalist community. They would come in, um, pretend to be Muslim, pretend to be praying. You know, these are, these are known things, but when you're going through it as a young person, 16, 17, 18, 19, when you've got friends getting kidnapped and taken into the um, basement of police stations, um, when, when people are disappearing and getting black bag, like this is why I say all of these things that everyone has talked about the night feel so much like my life. I often wonder, you know, I've been raided, I've been arrested, I've been beaten, I've been followed. Sometimes I wonder, Am I going to end up like Compa Berta? Am I going to end up like Conrad Joy? Am I going to end up older, no longer can run, no longer can be as feisty, can't, can't do the speeches, not getting the, the, you know, am I going to end up like Lucy Parsons, poor, with no one looking out for me? These are, the, the, this lecture panel, it's hitting right now, y'all. I just want y'all to let y'all know. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to summarize and tie a lot of things together. It's very difficult. I have, I'm, I'm old, you know, <laughs> so it's a long life, but these are questions that revolutionaries have. You might think we're fearless and we just do, and we just give, and we just, oh, we're always feeding someone. Oh, we're always waiting at the jails as soon as someone's out. We have fear too. In fact, most of what I do I'm fearful. It's the ability to push through that keeps me going. And when I hear stories about other women who push through, it gives me the fuel. It gives me the fuel to keep going. And so through the music, through the art, through the mutual aid, through the giving back, through the standing up and saying no to these corporations, to these police, to these oppressors, through checking each other on our shit, and holding each other accountable, like the brother Gregory said, of what we do to each other. It makes us, it makes us better people. And if we are really serious about this and we realize we're not voting our way out of this, like the comrade also said, it makes us better revolutionaries who will have to violently shake up the system to overthrow it, to overturn it so that we have what we need. And I wrote a song called, What is Freedom? And I'm gonna do it a cappella style. If y'all can bear with me, my equipment isn't up to be able to do it with music, 
but I am an MC. I'm a hip hop artist. I've been doing this for a long time. Have an album out right now called Trap Liberation Army, which is an homage to the Black Liberation Army. It's just me being hood. I come from the project. So, you know, currently I'm not in the projects, but um, in this in this economic situation, we all could be. <laughs> you know, outside um, with, with nowhere to go. And it's many of our brothers and sisters are already out there. And so, it, you know, um, I made a song called What is Freedom to question our concepts and thoughts of what, what exactly is freedom? What exactly, um, what is it that we say that we want or what we're looking for and in a oppressive society? So if y'all don't mind, I'm gonna drop a little bit of bars for y'all. Is that cool? Can I get some thumbs up or something? I can drop some bars. All right, so this is what is freedom from Trap Liberation Army. All right, so I love the hearts, love y'all. It goes, this land is not your land. This land is Taino, Inuit, Mexican, Turtle Island, Africans was kidnapped, but the white man who was settlers, not immigrants. Now you want a flight ban? Tell me that's not ignorance. My diligence keeps it militant. The US president's state was always terrorists. The pigs chase us so much we stays hella fit. Pour out the liquor for the dead and then the Ellis split. They bust the shotty in his dress while his mama cry. Now tell me what is freedom when we're always traumatized. I watch your boy bleed through right in front of me. The life inspectancy of black youths is troubling. At times we're stumbling, but show me where the money be. Ain't in our bank accounts, but corporations bubbling. So what is freedom? Uh, uh, yeah. Suggest, 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 suggest. Walk with me as my ligaments dip through tenements where ignorance is bliss and braille, but still not feeling it. What the hell? The cells all filled with pigmentation, still operating as plantations. But I'm from Virginia and ain't shit to do but burn the plantation down. For the overseer comes and leaves your man's face and down. Hit the underground, Amtrak, you call it a railroad. We just want that land back. Supremacist nemesis won't let us prosper, but keep it proper. Drink your water and clean your choppers. See, I can spit in lotus if you have a cloudy chakra. Be haunting all the rich folks, knocked up in your opera. Fist up in the air, bullets in the chamber. King sniping black messiahs trying to stop them in their mangers. What is freedom? Uh, it goes, it goes. I can't explain what so much pain is weighing heavy on my mind. Uh, uh, put us in chains and then you wonder why we're running all the time. Uh, uh. Uh, how are my babies to be free so they can glow and they can shine? Uh, freedom for me and mine, freedom for you and I. Uh, 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 yeah, freedom for me and mine, yeah. They never take me alive, although they tried with that 45, but me no worry, ancestors got me fortified. And my little homie, he got fortified, but that's okay, cause we gon' sell this, set you free when the water's high. Told you before, we ain't marching no more. Brazil and Paris is burning, learning, we ready for war. Sure, the Garifuna, Maroons, the Mau Mau, the Seminole, the Yamasee, the Ghost Dance, the Pow Wow, the Gullahs, the Reparations, Repatriation, then we drop in Millie Rock. When we get our liberation, what is freedom? Uh. Uh, it goes, I can't explain with so much pain that's weighing heavy on my mind. Uh, uh, put us in chains and then you wonder why we running all the time. Uh, uh, I said, I want my babies to be free so I can glow and they can shine. Uh, 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 freedom for me and mine, freedom for you and I. What we talking about, what we talking about. Freedom for me and mine, freedom for you and I. Appreciate y'all. Appreciate y'all, appreciate y'all. That's just a little acapella drop. Um, <laughs> again, um, we would have a lot of hip hop events at the Maroon House, documentaries, bands, groups, cannabis advocates, elders, youth, black, brown, indigenous. That's what the movement is about. That's what Berto is about getting everyone together to take care of, our, of the community, to protect the land, to protect the people. That's what Comrade Lucy was about when she was trying to get us to just overthrow all of this shit, right? That's what Rev Joy was about. Rev Joy wasn't just an anti-police brutality. She was a big person on mutual aid and feeding and taking care of people who did not have. And if we tie together everything that all of these women stood for, and we just took a little bit of that within ourselves and we utilize our art, everything that we have, whether we're teaching a class, whether we're just on the street, I'm telling you, it would be a great step towards us all liberating all of these oppressed lands that these damn um, greedy capitalists are extracting 
and, and just making the world terrible. Right now is a time that I wish that we could have a revival of the movements internationally. Let's get back on our internationalism, yes? Let's stop worrying about just us and look at the bigger picture. And let's overthrow this shit, y'all. Like real talk, let's let's actually make revolution not just something that we're talking about. Oh, a revolutionary new app just came out. Yeah, fuck that. That's not revolutionary. Overthrowing this this shit and creating something new in its place that is beneficial for all people, for oppressed people in particular. That's what we're talking about. So I, I just I'm so thankful to everyone who is a presenter. Thank you, Etsy, for inviting me to be a part of this panel. Um, I wasn't watching my time, so I don't know if I did too much, but I know we went over anyway, but I know we're going to open all up to questions and things of that nature. Um, I'll put my link up for where you can hear more of that music if you're into hip, the hip hop, the hippity hop. It's at simile.bandcamp.com. I'm spelling my own name wrong. Um, S-I-M-A-L-E. -E. Boom. Um, and I have some more works that are coming out. I have a pod. If you check out the, I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at simile, RBG, Instagram, and Twitter, just simile on Facebook. And it'll have links to Marooncast, which is my podcast. I talk about a lot of stuff like this. I talk about hip hop. I talk about art. I talk about, I talk about the state <laughs> because I am an uh, anti-capitalist. I am an anarchist, and I talk a lot about the state. Um, and I do a lot of mutual aid work in the Baltimore City area. I used to do a lot of mutual aid work in D.C. as well as in Virginia. Um, hit me up if you're ever on this side or you want to bond or connect. Um, I'll also put my email up there. I appreciate you all. I don't want to take up any more time, but um, all I can say is, like I always say at the end of Maroon Cast, all power to the people. Peace. All power to the people. Thank you so much, Sima Lee. Appreciate you so much. <clears throat> um, I know that, thank you, thanks so much to everyone who has um, sat with us in this, in this really amazing, powerful, heavy event um i yeah learned so much and it was, it was just really inspiring and i got teary-eyed hearing Simon Lee talk about you know what revolutionaries um think about their future because um <clears throat> that's really real um i am um you know uh people ask me to close out the space um, I, yeah, I think I, if people permit me, if it's okay, um, I do want to close out with a, with a song, um, that I actually created while I was incarcerated. Um, I'm a trans woman. Um, I, uh, I identify as Afro-Indigenous as well, uh, specifically Black feet and, uh, Filipinx and Black and, um, yeah, like uh, I was incarcerated in a men's facility for attempting to liberate medicine when I was houseless. And um, that is a kind of a systemic issue for a lot of uh, trans women, uh, of specifically of color, specifically black trans women um, who, um, you know, can't often get work uh, because of uh, you know, living precarious lives and have to resort to survival crimes because the economy as it is, is very, uh, it's very transphobic. Um, so, you know, it's like, how else are we gonna find means to survive if not um, resorting to, to other alternatives like, like survival crimes. <clears throat> um, so uh, this song was written while I was incarcerated. I'm actually gonna um, put up my uh, picture, my um, screen saver, because uh, it's actually an image of, um, I'm also a visual artist, uh, something that I created for TGIJP, which is an organization that serves um, trans um, and gender nonconforming and intersex peoples who are incarcerated and they provide resources and, um, uh, this this image was actually created 
um, for uh, their their organization to help continue with. Uh, it was made into a greeting card um, and also posters, but the greeting card is used to um, uh, help with their prison prison letter writing correspondence that they have with incarcerated tra trans and uh, gender nonconforming peoples. Um, and yeah, so the the song that I, I wrote while I was incarcerated um, is something that I sing often, uh, especially I've been to I've been incarcerated many times. I have that in common, you know, with other uh, anti authoritarians or anarchists or insurrectionaries. Um, and, um, you know, this is this was created to uplift myself. Um, as well as other people who are incarcerated. So this is, this is to political prisoners everywhere. Um, and in the cool stylings of, uh, you'll, you'll, the, the melody is really familiar. I like to take popular songs and um, turn them into like more anti-state um, insurrectionary <laughs> songs. <clears throat> Poverty hurts. They shine the light on my every squares. Incarceration is a disease of a nation. Poverty hurts. They shine the light on my every squares. Trying to fix something that they can't fix because it ain't me. It's this complex prison industry and petty at least small. Ah, in my cheese small. Daddy said that you're not a girl. Work hard like a ham. That's all that matters. Black, brown, yellow, red. It's not our system. We can do better. You're just another slave. Labor the pain away. This time I'm gonna take them down cause they're criminalizing black, trans and brown. Poverty hurts. They shine the light on whatever squares. Incarceration is a disease of a nation. Ah, uh -huh. Poverty hurts. They shine the light on my Elvis wears. Trying to fix something that they can't fix because it ain't me. It's this damn new form of slavery. Capitalismo. You stay distracted and spend your wage. TV says be good consumers, but don't steal. And don't run away, cause cops will say, should have shot him sooner. You're just another slave, waging the pain away. This time we're gonna take them down cause they're criminalizing us out of town. Poverty hurts, they shine the light on my Elvis wears. Gentrification is a disease of a nation. Poverty hurts, poverty hurts. They shine the light on my every words. Assimilating into what we can't reach, cause it ain't we. Let's abolish prison industry. Por anarchismo. Thank you. Thank you everyone for such an amazing event. Hey. Um, thank you all presenters and artists and yeah, much love, revolutionary love to y'all. Um,